Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Always glad to have you with us. And this week, we're going to dive into the world of tech and talk about a company we've been tracking since we started this show all the way back in 2012. And I'm joined by Angus Davis. Angus is the founder and CEO of Upserve. And Angus, uh, first, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Tim White uh, pointed out to me this morning. I said, I looked it up. You were our first ever, I think, four-time guest. And he said, <laughs> you're like Steve Martin and Tom Hanks on SNL. So oh, wow. I don't know how big that is for Executive Suite, but uh, we're glad to have you here again. Uh, I hope to try to be as funny as <laughs> yeah, those two. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We'll look for the jokes. Um, so I always love talking about uh, Upserve because it's always interesting what you guys are doing, but it's also because you work with restaurants, and I think people really can understand that, and it's tangible to them where sometimes tech stuff can people feel like goes over their heads a little. But right. for those who aren't familiar with the company, just quick thumbnail sketch what you do at Upserve. Sure. We're basically the technology that the restaurant runs on. Uh, we're essentially the second most important thing after the stove or oven that's used to to cook the food. Uh, so from the point of sale system that the waiters and waitresses use to enter in the orders that are fired in the kitchen, that's called breadcrumb point of sale. Um, all the way up to the reporting, which is called Upserve HQ, that's the product that lets our restaurant customers understand which menu item brings customers back, maybe which bartender is giving away too many fr free beers to her <laughs> friends, um, you know, and which member of the wait staff is the best at selling the wine. Um, and it's, uh, it's really helping restaurateurs to be more successful, helping them basically run a smoother shift with their staff, but also delight the guests that are coming into their restaurant. And we've, back. we've talked about this before, but um, when you, uh, when Upserve, which, which started out with a different name, was in a somewhat different space, and as you moved into this, it was partly because you found restaurants kind of hadn't, many restaurants hadn't necessarily taken advantage yet of what technology could offer them in the way some other industries had. And it's surprising because the restaurant industry is actually the second largest private sector employer after the healthcare industry. One out of every 10 Americans in the in the workforce is actually working in a restaurant. Hard to outsource. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not going to China. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yet, despite that, despite, oh, and Americans now spend uh, over $800 billion per year eating out at restaurants. And in fact, last year was the first year where we're spending more money dining out than we're spending on food to cook at home. So there's a shift going on within that too. Yeah, people want folks to do it for them. Yeah. It's like everything in our life, trying to be <laughs> right. more convenient. So, uh, and despite all that, uh, technology, it's helped other sectors of the economy, but most restaurants are kind of operating on 20-year-old technology. They're not operating on the modern, uh, what we call cloud-based systems, and the data that's flowing through their restaurant isn't really being turned into something useful that would help them run a, either a more profitable restaurant, provide a better experience to their guest, or run a, a better shift with their staff. So that's really what we're trying to do. So um, as I said, we've been tracking you on the show uh, with interviews over the last couple of years. Give us uh, a, an update. How big has the company gotten? Uh, how many restaurants are you serving right now? How sure. you, what, what are your metrics at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So today we're working with over 10,000 restaurants all across the United States. Uh, I know those of us that, uh, that don't like drive more than 10 minutes for milk have a, <laughs> have a hard time thinking beyond Rhode Island, but, but probably 95% or more of our customers are, are outside uh, driving range of here. But we work mostly with full service restaurants. Now to put that in perspective, you know, over 10,000 restaurants, there's there's close to a million restaurants in the US and of that about 300,000 are what we call full service meaning waiters and waitresses mm -hmm. and that's kind of the the center of our our sweet spot. Um, so we're really excited about the traction. We're seeing a lot of growth, but we also feel like there's a huge amount left uh, to grow because it's such a huge uh, a market. Um, we have over 250 employees now, most based right here in Rhode Island. Uh, we also have an office in Denver, and then recently through an acquisition, we have an office now in Tel Aviv, Israel. So yeah, that's have, a brand new thing, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so that's a little bit, I guess, about the growth of the company, and we certainly have aspirations to keep that growth going. So um, when you look ahead, you uh, mentioned just now, you just acquired, we're taping this in August of 18, and uh, last month, an Israeli company called Simple Order, uh, you're rebranding what it does is upserve inventory as it comes into your company. Um, and my understanding is there, this is the back of the house, kind of how much, how much steak do we have, how much is that wine selling out, that kind of stuff? Exactly right. So when you think about, if you're running a restaurant, what's the business of a restaurant? And two of your biggest costs are your labor cost and your food cost. Typically, just to use round numbers, it's, it's, uh, it wouldn't be uncommon they'd each be about 30% of sales. So 
they're really the only two things that you have a lot of control over mm -hmm. when you're running the restaurant is getting a handle on your food cost. So with this technology, um, it allows restaurants to immediately see exactly what the food cost is for every item on their menu, every week, every shift that they're running. It also allows them to automatically place the orders. Mm. So as their things are starting to run low, they can just hit a button, the orders go out to all the various suppliers that uh, are providing food and beverages to the restaurant. So it's about um, helping them be more profitable, helping them automate the ordering process, which saves them a lot of time, and also it reduces waste. Uh, when you're a restaurant, it's important that you be mindful of the orders you're, you're placing. Right, and in yeah. fact, every year, unfortunately, there's a tremendous amount of food lost to waste. So that's what this system's all about. Make more money, save time, reduce waste. And uh, when you were looking at this acquisition and eventually decided to go through with it um, as a company, what do you think this would add for UpServe, and what are you, what are you hoping will come of integrating this uh, Israeli company into yours? Sure. Well, our vision vision is to be a single platform that the restaurants can use to essentially run all aspects of their business. And today we're doing a few of those things. We're doing point of sale system, which is breadcrumb, analytics, UpServe HQ. We have an online ordering module. Um, and now we have UpServe inventory to help you manage your food cost. Over time, we'd like to broaden that into other areas too. So things like um, helping you schedule your staff or um, thinking about reservations where we've recently entered into some partnerships. So ultimately, we want to be a single platform so that restaurant tours don't have to deal with the headaches of trying to get multiple systems to talk to each other. They can have one single platform on which they run their whole business. So in 2017, you guys announced a big investment, over $100 million, from Vista Equity Partners, which is a major, major investment firm. Um, and it was kind of, a, apart from the money, it was kind of a sign of uh, support for your model and, and what they thought you could do with that. So that's a major new investment. It also means more voices in the room at the <laughs> board meetings and such yes. about the strategy and everything. How has it been going? What, is that, what has it been like for you to have have them be a part of uh, UpServe? I'd say the biggest word that immediately comes to mind is it's been exciting. Um, working with Vista, they work. They have about 50 companies in the portfolio that are all doing something similar to us, which is software as a service that's, that's offered to other businesses, as opposed to things like Instagram, which is targeted consumers. And from that, uh, myself, my executive team, and really all of our uh, employees that are on the team are able to learn from the best practices of some of these other uh, best-in-class companies. And so that's really um, one big uh, advantage that we've gained as a result of the Vista partnership. The other thing is that um, they've brought tremendous scale to the business. So with Vista behind us, it's given us the ability to do things like, for example, the recent acquisition of um, Simple Order. So even though we're a small company in that, you know, about 250 or so employees, we'll probably end the year closer to 300, um, we have the scale of Vista, which when you look at it in total, you know, they have over $34 billion in, in assets under management. It's billion uh, with a there's, B. <laughs> yeah, there's tens of thousands of employees across the 50 Vista portfolio companies, and we're sharing best practices across uh, those different company lines to, to improve and to get better at what we're doing every day. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk much more with Angus Davis, founder and CEO of UpServe, about the company's future, what they're up to now, and maybe some of his thoughts on the political scene here in Rhode Island. Stick with us on Executive. Executive suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Meese. We're talking today with Angus Davis. We've had him on many times before to track the growth of his company, UpServe, which he founded, and where he is the CEO. They do software for restaurants, and we're talking about that and uh, some of the growth that's happening. You alluded to it earlier, but I want to um, circle back to Denver. Yeah. Um, you, we all have heard about HQ2 for Amazon, their effort to find their big new headquarters, uh, wherever that will end up being. But uh, you uh, said that your HQ2 is actually in Denver. You uh, a couple months earlier in 2018, I believe you opened up a customer operations center. Why Denver and what's going on out there? Sure. Well, what we want to do is to have um, bring more of our support, customer support operations in-house. We'd previously worked with some outsourcing partners, US-based, uh, but we wanted to have that uh, among our own employee base. So uh, we looked around at a few different options. We have customers, as I mentioned earlier, all over the country. So one of the things we did want to be is a little bit uh, more centralized time zone. Um, we provide customer support 24/7. So you know, you call us at Christmas Eve at 3 a.m. and somebody's going to answer the phone, and we, you know, we try to answer the phone within 30 seconds when a restaurant calls. That's us. a great point. I hadn't even thought about that. And restaurants obviously can be open until 1 a.m., 2 a.m., depending Abs on what city you're in. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a mission critical thing. You know, if you can't 
collect payments from somebody or yeah. uh, enter the order in, you know, it's a big problem. Yeah, so we've now. got to have support. And so, frankly, that's become a differentiator for our company relative to some of our competitors in the market. Um, is having really high quality support. Um, so we looked at a few different places. We looked at Salt Lake City, um, we looked at Denver, we looked at Phoenix, Arizona, and some other places. Um, but ultimately, the reason we decided to open an office in Denver was that the talent, the access to talent in Denver um, uh, was exactly what we were looking for. And uh, we opened the office in January. Uh, and today we employ just over 50 people in the Denver office. Uh, so it's been a, a big success for us, and I'm really happy about it. But we also, you know, we have, a lot of people working here in Rhode Island, um, so that's important too. And you know that's always the next people here opening somewhere else. They think, ooh, are they thinking of leaving? Could it end up the headquarters out there? Talk about, your, I mean, you're Rhode Island born and bred, so that's, you know, there's a reason you're here in the first place. But, you know, do you still see Rhode Island as the place you can grow, you know, central headquarters? Well, uh, absolutely. We're still growing here in Rhode Island, and we're hiring in Rhode Island right now across a range of different job functions, including uh, our tech team, which is one of the, the key elements of our Rhode Island presence is where all, most of our engineers are based. Um, we have a large engineering uh, team right here in Providence. And so um, in recent months, uh, we've also hired not just folks that have a lot of experience to that engineering team, but also folks who maybe are getting started as engineers, folks who maybe went through a, a training boot camp uh, to become uh, software engineers. So um, that's a big part of our growth. And also sales uh, and marketing are also areas where we're doing a lot of hiring here in Rhode Island. And the tech uh, workforce thing is always interesting, and I'm always curious your thoughts on that, because that's something you hear about a lot, that finding enough uh, skilled workers who have the engineering background or know, you know, to have that in Rhode Island where we have a smaller tech presence than obviously Boston and Cambridge. How, have you seen improvement in the pipeline of workers who, who have what you're looking for? Is it just you're having to skill people up? What's, what's the outlook on that? I think as we've gotten to be a bigger company, more mature, we've been uh, more able to help uh, folks that don't have a tremendous amount of experience coming in to, say, a software engineering position. Um, we, we're in a better place now as a bigger, more mature company to help them develop those skills. Um, in terms of where Rhode Island sits relative to other communities, certainly we don't have that tech e ecosystem that, say, a San Francisco or even uh, New York or a Boston has. Um, but, you know, we, we're increasingly, I think, holding our own. And one of the things I'm really proud about uh, with regards to UpServe is that we've been named one of the best places to work in Rhode Island now for five or six years in a row. Um, so, you know, the word is out there that it's a cool place to work and you're going to develop your skills and advance your career. And, th and that's something that, that we're proud about. So that's and that's interesting to hear, too, because you you talked. I remember you were on a couple of years ago and you said, you know, there's so much talk about getting more tech jobs in Rhode Island, getting more tech companies here. And you said you really need a critical mass so that people feel like they can go from, uh, you know, if they try a startup, there are companies you could go work for if you have a baby and you suddenly like, I want I want Angus to find the money. And I'm going to just earn a paycheck or something. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's been uh, with some of the announcements of companies coming? Do you think it's it's I guess you do. You said a critical mass is starting well, to be there. Well, I think so. You see companies like Upsell that have grown, um, you know, uh, Virgin uh, Health uh, grown. Um, but I think you got to be careful, for example, the government trying to pick, you know, GE Digital. I mean, GE is a, is a kind of case study and, and things going off the rails over the last few years as a company. Yeah. And it looks as though GE Digital is going to be um, and sold off. And so I don't think it's, uh, it's possible for the government to really pick the winners and losers. I think what we need to do, all of us, government and the private sector, is just make sure we're creating a a playing field that attracts everyone to come out and try. Um, and we aren't yet at the point where, you know, if it was a mall, you know, get, used to have that anchor tenant in the, in the shopping plaza or in the mall, we don't yet have a homegrown anchor tenant. I think you would need to see a company grow to probably 1,500 employees, mm -hmm. 1,200 employees, something like this. Um, uh, and so we're not there yet, but there's definitely some of us that, uh, that are that are trying. Aspire to be the anchor to, tenant. We're trying to do our part. You'll be the Leechmere. Uh, <laughs> eventually, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe not, not the Leechmere. Yeah, not the Leechmere, we'll yeah, say yeah, on yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, talking about when you think about the future of the company from your perspective, always seeing in tech, Virgin Pulse is an example, actually. That was Shape sure. Up, Rajiv yep. Kumar's company, and they were bought by Virgin, and then they bought another company, and they're growing. Um, eventually, most tech entrepreneurs who have success have to make those decisions of, are we going to try to just grow the company and stay independent, or are we going to allow some 
someone to come in, you know, usually it's, it can be a pretty big payday for the people who founded it and put the equity sure. in. Um, what are your thoughts right now on that? Do you want to keep building and growing up, sir? Are you looking to see if there's someone who wants to acquire you? Well, I think you got to separate those things a little bit. Um, I tend to think of it as how we're running and operating the business. Um, so, you know, how many customers do we have? How happy are the customers? Are the customers referring us to other restaurants? Are employees wanting to join the company? Do they want to stick around? So on. Those are all things having to do with operating the business. Then over here, you got the investors, essentially the capital structure of the business. And so my viewpoint is you got to operate the business for growth, to be an attractive place to work, to provide a lot of value to your customers. Um, if you're doing those things, then yeah, the capital side, the, cap the value of the shares of the business, that's obviously going to grow. And there's going to be people that come in and out of that capital structure as companies grow into different stages of their corporate life. Um, but what I try to focus on is operating the business. And, uh, and sure, you know, those opportunities, they've been there in the past, they continue to come up all the time, and, and they'll be there in the future. Um, but if you run a business for the capital structure, as opposed to run a business to delight customers and to make it a rewarding place for employees to come into work every day, then um, that seldom works out well for okay. the capital structure or for the customers. A great point. That's a really good point. All right, when we come back, we're going to hear some more great points, hopefully, from Angus Davis, founder of Upserve. So stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. We're talking today with Angus Davis, making his triumphant return, founder and CEO of Upserve, which is just growing and growing in the restaurant software space. And Angus, um, you have a great origin story of getting into tech. You uh, you make no bones about you may not have been on track to be valedictorian in your high school <laughs> at the yeah. time, but you were into computers. And you got into this by actually partly because you were involved in a message board for Netscape, right? People might remember Netscape, the original web browser. I remember using it in the 1990s. Talk a little about that, sure. how it all started for you in tech. I was kind of a screw up in high school. Uh, I wasn't the star athlete. I was trying to be polite. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't a star athlete or a star uh, trombone player, um, but I had an after school job building websites and I was really interested in that. I loved doing it. And at that time, uh, mid 90s, websites were a new thing. So there was an online forum where Netscape, one of the main tech leaders at that time, you could ask questions and talk with other developers making websites. So I became an active participant, and one thing led to another. They noticed that I started answering more questions than I was asking. And Out they, in California, they noticed. They this, did, yeah. yeah, and they offered me a summer internship. Um, so that's cut. Well, first they offered me. Uh, to write some articles for a developer website teaching other people, and then they offered me a summer internship. So that's really how I got my start. And then eventually they brought you out and you joined the company and you were there and, and onward and upward from there. But it's, it's, it is interesting because uh, you, you wound up, you didn't go the college path. You went out there to Netscape and it's, right. it's worked out. I was planning to go to college uh, the following fall and I went there for a summer job when I was, uh, I believe I, I became an employee at Netscape when I was 18. So. Um, I was the youngest uh, full-time employee there, and I learned a lot. Uh, I kind of got thrown into the deep end of the pool. <laughs> One of the things about Northern California and the tech scene there is a lot of folks that had, uh, were part of that had kind of come up through non-traditional backgrounds themselves. Mm. So it was uh, it, it was Steve weird. Jobs. Yeah. yeah, it was weird, but it wasn't as weird as we might think, uh, given that they had a different culture out there. What do you think? I uh, just today, the day we're taping this, Apple hit a trillion dollars, and uh, someone shared out the stories from around that time, around 1997, when Apple looked like Apple might go out of business or be gobbled up by Microsoft or something. What do you take as a CEO as the lesson from that that they could hit? basically rock bottom and now be the biggest company in the world 20 years later. I think as an entrepreneur, one of the most valuable skills you can have is the ability to notice when something maybe is going wrong and have the, the self-awareness to be like, hey, maybe you got to try something different. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, And that's certainly been the case in a lot of companies I've been involved with where you persevere. Um, certainly Apple was at a low point you know, when Steve Jobs came back and Microsoft led an investment that many, many would say you know, helped save the company. Yeah. Um, but there's also been times where businesses weren't understood early on. For example, 19, I think it was 99, there was an article in the cover of Barron's, the financial uh, paper, called Amazon.bomb, and saying <laughs> that it was going to go out of business, basically. And of course, today, Amazon is another uh, tremendously valuable and successful mm -hmm. company. Um, so, you know, don't count people out. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, for example, that would like to see Tesla and Elon Musk fail. And, you know, I think you'll see uh, a great entrepreneur like that persevere. And uh, that's a really, that grit, that perseverance, that's a super valuable skill 
um, in any business. You don't have to be the size yeah. of Apple. Reporters uh, live in dread of having their names under a headline like that. That doesn't age very well. Um, <laughs> so you, you talked before, we, you alluded to it, about the picking winners and losers, this debate over tax incentives in Rhode Island. There's been a lot of use of those to bring other tech companies there. You folks have actually never received or sought, to my knowledge, any tax incentives or anything like that. You've grown organically. Does it I just, does it frustrate you to see other companies getting that? You know, do you think it's do you think it's a bad move? Do you think it's unfair? The, uh, well, I think there's a variety of different programs that the government can offer. One of the one program we did take advantage of is something that basically says, you know, hey, if you start a company in Rhode Island, um, uh, you know, there won't be as many capital gains taxes if you end up, you know, being successful at some day. But we've never saw any. Uh, funds from the government. Yeah. We never sought a government loan. We never sought a government tax credit or anything like this. And um, you know, look, if I'm the guy at home or gal at home running a small business, I guess the question would be, why is take for example a real estate developer? Why is a real estate developer, for example, more entitled to somebody coming along and giving them a, a huge uh, swath of, of money to to build a building than say a, a plumber to to hire another uh, assistant or to get some more equipment or a new truck? Uh, and so I think my view has always with the government been, hey, let's create an even playing field. It's like an ice rink where you want the Zamboni to go out and make <laughs> that ice super smooth and super slick so that the skaters can all go out there and skate fast. Um, and there, there's certain times for the government to get involved, but certainly when it comes to the tech industry, there's a tremendous amount of private sources of capital for the tech industry. Um, so you know maybe there's something special like, I don't know, uh, uh, some you know in past cases the government's got involved in figuring out how to split the atom or put a man <laughs> on the moon or something, but more the basic research side. Yeah, yeah you know fundamental research. But um, you know if you want to start a. a software business today, there's plenty of private sources of capital for that. Yeah. So I want to do a total 180 on the topic, um, and this is uh, more from your personal life, but recently there was a tragedy in Bristol near your home where a young boy was killed on the bike path, um, and it, it turned out there's no stop sign. Uh, my wife actually was covering it. Um, I think she might have shot this video of you folks there. Um, and this is, I believe you're in there, and a couple other neighbors who d went out and put up your own stop sign. And in the end, Rideout said, well, let the stop sign stay up because, uh, you know, for a safety thing and it's not causing any harm, even though technically it's not right now an authorized stop sign. What's the lesson you take out of that? You know, you, ha you guys had the gumption to do that. Sure. I mean, that specific issue aside, I think the important thing I'd encourage anyone doing around, it's something I frankly think we have too little of, is we need our, our business leaders to stick their neck out in public. Um, one person asked me the other day about this particular issue about the stop sign. I say, well, can't you call the governor? Won't, won't she take your phone call? And I answered the person. I said, yeah, you know, she probably would. Uh, you know, we're a well-known company here, and I've had plenty of positive interactions with the governor. Um, but on this issue and others like it, it's important to come out in public. You know, the politicians, they're pros. They're used to getting hits in the public. <laughs> they hear it from the media and others. We as business leaders need to put pressure, public pressure, on the government to do things that we think are the right things for our community. So in this particular example, that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to advocate to make the roads safer by applying public pressure on RIDOT. Um, they were, in this particular case, they said, hey, we'll do a study for six months, but we're not going to do anything right now. We said, well, OK, well, we're going to do something right now. And if you want the only action you take this week to be removing a stop sign instead of putting one in, then that can be your decision. And you know, in a roundabout way, we're just trying to advocate for something we believe in. And I think this particular tragedy aside, I think it'd be very important for business leaders to publicly, publicly stick their neck out and advocate. All right, well, that's all the time we have this week, so we'll leave on that note. Angus Davis, founder and CEO of Upserve. We'll see you back here probably in two years to continue your Steve Martin <laughs> run on Executive Suite. And all we'll right. see you back here next week on the show, and you can catch it on WPRI.com. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.